Listen, I get it. A lot of people pine for the days when MTV played music videos. Personally, I miss the cartoons. The network was also a showcase for bizarre animation and a launching pad for independent artists whose work may never found a large audience otherwise. In this video, we're going to be looking at some of these artists, as well as the series that introduced them to the mainstream. Ladies and gentlemen, rock and roll. From the very beginning, animation was a major part of MTV's aesthetic. The early promos and channel IDs were produced by Olive Jar Studios, but in 1986 the network started producing animation in-house. The surreal, nonsensical nature of these cartoons helped establish MTV's character. It presented itself as youthful, alternative, a sort of counter to the received antiquity of network television. After all, this was cable. MTV was showcasing a wide range of animation styles, from traditional cartoons to stop motion and puppetry, with the only through line seemingly being weirdness. Given the cost associated with producing animation, the 15 second or less format offered auteur animators artistic freedom. I mean, yes, it was advertising, but these artists were still allowed to express their own unique visions, and whether audiences knew it or not, they were being exposed to masters of the medium. Stevie Washington, the angry youth, born to die. New York's New York, the turn of the century, all crime. MTV would venture into animated storytelling with 1987's Stevie and Zoya. Created by Joe Horn, the series of one minute shorts follows future cops as they thwart evil plans. The quick pace and loose style gives the show a frenetic energy, and its breaking of the fourth wall feels years ahead of its time. This is mostly done by leaving in mistakes made by narrator Russell Johnson, the professor from Gilligan's Island. Discovers Claude, the supercomputer super computer gone mad and destroys it. I, I know what's happening here. I'm rushing. I'm going to. Okay, well. Memo Waldi, the voodoo witch, is looting the entire city. How very relatable. In 1991, MTV would debut Liquid Television. This packaged what they were already doing with promos into a 30 minute collection of short cartoons. Most were commissioned exclusively for the series, with others being acquired or adapted, specifically from underground comics anthology Raw. This included work from Richard Sala and Charles Burns. Liquid Television featured a mixture of one off and recurring segments. Among those recurring included Stick Figure Theater, in which crew drawings depicted scenes from classic movies, as well as the live action combination Art Scroll Girls of Doom and Winter Steel. Winter Steel was centered around a puppet biker hunting down her lover slash enemy. As the story unfolds, she performs all sorts of questionable acts. It was written by artist and critic Cintra Wilson, who also created the puppets and voiced the titular character. It's this variety that I really love about Liquid Television. Though visually, and even thematically different, Winter Steel still somehow fits alongside the other shorts perfectly. True to its name, the show felt fluid, with one segment seamlessly flowing into the next. My favorite segment has to be Aeon Flux, an experimental sci-fi series created by Peter Chung. As an example of what I said earlier, about artists being allowed to express their own visions, Chung had been working on Rugrats, of all things, prior to creating Aeon Flux. Finding that work limiting, Chung really let loose, delivering this expressive psychological thriller. Set in the future, Aeon Flux follows a secret agent as she attempts to infiltrate an enemy base on an assassination mission. The story is told almost entirely without dialogue. It's hyper-violent and very sexual, with allusions to BDSM and other fetishes. It was serialized throughout the first season of Liquid Television, with self-contained shorts airing in the second. It would become a standalone series in 1995, lasting one season. <coughs> Liquid Television will likely be remembered most for launching the career of Mike Judge in his creation, Beavis and Butthead. Judge began animating in 1989. In 1991, he produced The Honky Problem as well as Office Space. Both would eventually air on Liquid Television, with the latter being adapted as a live-action film in 1999. However, what resonated most with the audience was 1992's Frog Baseball. This introduced them to delinquent teens Beavis and Butthead. They proved so popular, they were given their own series the following year. That ran seven seasons and spawned a film, a spin-off, Daria, and a reboot 14 years later. This success really overshadowed Liquid Television, which ended in 1995. The brand would be revived in 2014, but I think this feels more like a half-hearted imitation rather than a successor. MTV continued to produce animation throughout the 1990s, though their in-house production would be abandoned in favor of acquiring shows from other networks. Liquid Television was long before my time, but I can still recognize its DNA in the media I grew up with. 
In terms of MTV's animated output, I'm much more familiar with their shows from the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, but still the series' influence, both in weirdness and showcasing animation, I think, lives on with Adult Swim. It's sad that due to music licensing this will probably never see a proper release. It's thankfully not lost, uh, clips and VHS rips are available online, and both Anne Flux and Beavis and Butthead have DVD releases with other segments as bonus features. If you want to see more, I will post links in the description uh, to what is out there, and if you enjoy this video, uh, give us a like, uh, please subscribe, and check out some of our others, like our look at Mac Rating's Life in Hell, or our brief history of computer animation. Thank you so much for watching.